Welcome to Make It Wild. I'm Rachel Smith, the coordinator of volunteer resources here at the museum. Assisting behind the scenes are Jane Levino, Sugden Chief Curator of Education, and Julia Spencer, Associate Curator of Education and Outreach. And our special guest tonight is Sue Tyler. Thank you for joining us for this program and for your support of the National Museum of Wildlife Arts annual Art Leadership Scholarship in honor of the memory of Dick Jennings. Proceeds from our Make It Wild classes directly benefit a local high school senior each year. Here's a brief agenda for the next hour and a half. First, we'll take a look at some of Sue's work and hear about her inspiration. Then Sue will lead us through some of her painting techniques to help us create a loose abstract landscape along with her. At the end of the class, we will make sure there's time for detailed questions and optional sharing of your own work. If you'd like to paint along with Sue and you have supplies in front of you, then please do, or simply learn by watching. If you are participating live tonight, you will receive a recording of this program in a few days, which you can rewatch as many times as you like or save to your computer as well. And now I'm pleased to introduce Sue Tyler. Sue's images reference the Western landscape, its seasons, light, geology, inhabitants, and history. Sue was born in Idaho and began exploring the landscape at an early age. She taught high school art for 25 years, and in 2013, she began painting full time. Sue paints plein air and studio landscapes in acrylic, watercolor, and mixed media. Her work is shown throughout the West, winning awards in state, local, and national shows. Sue continues to enjoy teaching art to others and creating partnerships with nonprofit agencies, especially conservation groups through her art. Thank you for being here, Sue. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to share some of my techniques with you. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I spend a lot of time plein air painting and I brought a couple of quick uh, small studies that I've done and they're done on panel and acrylic paint. Um, but um, at some point in time, I enjoy studio work and I like to kind of loosen up my paintings even more. And I think of all good paintings as being an abstraction of some sort. So um, I'm gonna take you from something like this that I do into um, some of the woodblock paintings that we're gonna do tonight. And these are a few examples of work that I've done. Um, but, uh, and so this is the techniques that we're going to explore tonight. And um, uh, I want you guys to think a little bit about um, design and I'm going to go through the process of how I come to something that is just a little more, I don't know, ethereal, maybe more instinctive, um, with more of good design invo involved in it rather than just a subject matter. Although you can see with these, um, I have used, I've added a subject to every one of these, but usually the design comes first. The wood blocks, as I mentioned in my materials list, uh, can be a lot of different sizes. This one is a six by eight. It's a little bigger than the ones that I usually use. Should I just leave them down here? Like that? We can see both. Okay. We can see both, so you're um, and then this is a six by six. And some of these are a little higher than others. These are called cradle boards and they're made this way. You can buy them at a number of art supply stores. And then this is a four by 12 and it, um, it's just a little bit different type of format than the others. Uh, and I'm not saying you should use one type or another. Um, I'm just showing you what I use and I tend to use a variety of, of materials. I'm gonna put these aside for just a minute. Um, I think when I put out my supply list, I asked people to buy wood blocks and my preference for you was to have something that was a square or a two to one ratio. In other words, two, uh, one length and, uh, or one, one length and two times the other length. Um, these are seven eighths cradle. So these are seven eighths wide. Um, some of the ones you saw in my examples were taller. Anything that you prefer 
works. And this is the type that I, um, that I buy, or I have bought for this process. It's called a DaVinci Pro panel. And this is a little bit bigger size, but we're gonna use all three of these tonight. The other materials I have to show you is, um, I'll show you some of the steps of the process that I used these. And then the other thing that I wanna show you is some of the materials I asked you to buy. And um, I wanna re remind everybody or just let you know that this is just one way to make these. Uh, and it's something that I have experimented with and enjoyed um, using. And I start with my acrylics and um, usually three different colors and white. So these are the three colors that I use. And I, I really like golden products. I use a little different acrylic that is a golden product with my plein air work. These tend to dry way too fast, but in the studio, they're great because they dry fast. Um, they, these colors are red, blue, or I mean, yellow, blue, and red, but you can see the color type is different than just that. And this is, I think these are on your list as well, but this is a quadacridone gold, a thala blue, and a lizarin crimson hue. And um, you wouldn't have to use these. You could use any kind of red, yellow, blue that you wanted to. And of course the white is there so you can make different tones light and dark of these colors or mixes of them. I use these though, because they're a really good way to start. We're gonna layer these transparently. And that means that you're putting color over color, but you can see the color underneath the color you put over that. And so I like these because the characteristic of these colors are that they are very transparent. In other words, that you, you can put a alizarin crimson over a white and, or I mean, yeah, over a white and then something else over that. And you could see the red, the alizarin underneath it. So um, if I go back and I use this example right here of one of my pieces, you might be able to see that just a little bit that you can see what colors I added on top of other colors. That's what it means by transparency. If you notice though, in this landscape that I just kind of created from the abstract block that I started with, um, there's parts there that just totally block out the paint. So on your list, I also had a list of your red, yellow, blue, okay colors. And so if you're making a subject of something, you might use these red, yellow, blue, opaque colors. And they have names too, but you can see clearly that this is supposed to be a yellow, a blue, and a red. Sorry, I kind of conf maybe confused you the first time. I'm a little nervous, but anyway, these are more opaque colors. So when you cover an area, it's going to, it, uh, what it was underneath is gonna be less likely to show up. So I hope that makes sense. But primarily, we're going to use a transparent um, triad, you call it, red, yellow, and blue, plus the white. The other materials I have are the gesso. This is a white gesso. And a gesso is designed to have some kind of a primer support for these blocks. You can also buy these that are already gessoed. But if you do, I always think a coat of white gesso, somewhat thin, is a good idea to put on anyway. It just, add, it just enriches your colors as you go along. I also use a black gesso, and you can also buy uh, gessos that are different colors. But I just stick with black and white for this process that I'm doing. I also like texture, if you can see that. These are, sure, I'll take those, that'd be great. These are blocks that have been gessoed with white gesso, and then I put this texture on it. Hopefully you guys can see that. 
And um, that is a product that Golden makes. I don't have it in its original jar because it was too big, but it's a molding paste. It kind of looks like thick hair gel, but it's a lot of fun to use. And again, if you wanted your boards to be smooth, you could keep them that way, but we're gonna go through the painting and you might be interested in that. Here's another product that Golden makes and it's called a crackle paste and it um, kind of leaves this kind of texture that looks like peeled paint when you're all finished with it. I'm not gonna use it tonight, but it's another fun product to try. I believe it was on your list of supplies. Um, I also suggested that maybe you would like some colors that are kind of shimmery, that add a little fun to your painting. And please have fun when you're doing these paintings because um, this is just really a fun way to paint. Um, this one is an iridescent bronze. Can you see it? Okay. And this is an iridescent silver. And then I have another copper at home. This piece that I painted the sides of is the copper, but you could also put it on a, um, uh, a painting as well. It's kind of fun. And um, gosh, there's lots of products if you start looking at Golden's website. And I just happen to like their paints. They are really light, fast, and um, they work really well. The fluids are really great for what we're trying to do because we want them to be very fluid, as it were. Um, and they also hold their color really well. You know, a lot of acrylics, and once you water them down, they kind of lose their vibrancy as a color. And the and golden products tend to not do that. So I like that about them. So anyway, we're gonna take these and go from here to here so I can show you that process. Maybe some of you have already done that, but if you haven't, this is something that I wanna show you. And, um, that's fine. and um, I like to do a number of boards at the same time. So I'll even put them together like this, but I'd like kind of playing around with this whole idea of design. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that in a few minutes. Anyway, I have a number of different brushes here. Most of my brushes are not expensive brushes. This is an inexpensive one that I often use with gesso. And it, you know, it's probably a dime store type. It's in pretty good shape. So it's gonna be easy to brush the gesso on. And I wanna get it wet first. And this palette right here is just a butcher tray that I cover with wax paper. You can use paper palettes or they have acrylic palettes if you want. I have never really gotten attached to any acrylic palettes that I liked. So I just improvise and do this. So anyway, um, I got my brush wet and all I'm doing is just covering it. And this looks a little bit thin right now, but it's okay. Mainly you just want to cover it. And um, there's really not much to it, but you just want to cover it. And if you go over the sides, it's okay. But I like to use texture on my paintings. And so I'm going to put the texture on, I kind of learn this shortcut. I'm not gonna let this all dry. I'm gonna put the texture on. Now I could use a little bit bigger brush for this six by 12. It's a pretty good size block. But if I move along here, um, and I didn't bring one that was very big because I didn't really think I needed it. And, um, you know, just use a brush for whatever size work that you're working on. I'm gonna thin that out just a little. This is not rocket science or anything. You're just covering it up so that it will take the painting a little better, okay? Uh, I usually stand up and do this, so this I'm probably a little awkward. 
I'm not a sitting type of painter. That's pretty good. That will work. I, you know, one thing that I tell beginners to do too with any kind of a surface is make sure your your corners are covered. It looks a lot better. You're usually gonna do some pretty good layering with paint. But and then you want to separate these because then they'll kind of stick together if you don't. I'm gonna get out my molding paste and a palette knife. I I was doing this with a group of students one time and I didn't have enough palette knives. So I just went down to the thrift store and got a bunch of little butter knives. So you don't have to have a palette knife, but this stuff, and it's kind of moving the, moving the uh, gesso around just a little bit. I wanted the gesso to be pretty thin. And you know, if you really want a good primer on your boards, you might even put two coats of gesso on. That doesn't ever hurt anything thin. Um, so, so this is the molding paste? This is the molding paste. Did I say gel? No, I okay. just didn't. Um, I Golden has gel products and they're fun to use too, but I mean, we're keeping it a little simpler. This is the molding paste. And, you know, I want it kind of flat. I, I want it to be textured so that I'm getting kind of a neat design here and paying attention to the edges of my block. But I also don't want it to build up too much. This would be okay. It's a little bit high though. But you could take this stuff as long as you were willing to let it dry long enough and um, and just build it up and kind of make it sculptural. And what do you have to lose? Just try it, you know? So anyway, that's my molding paste. This is what it looks like. Um, this stuff is so much fun. If you do use a palette knife or any expensive, well, or any tool that you want to keep track of, or your, or your brushes with acrylics, you got to keep them clean. So that reminds me, I got to clean my, my old brush, even though it's an old brush, I don't want to use it again. Okay. When I have a group of students in a workshop, I have people do this first. So they've got their paintings all ready to dry and they can get started on the next step. But that takes a little time. We have a very short amount of time. So, and I often do in workshops as well. So what I do now is I stop the whole process and say, well, this is the next step. What, yeah, they're gonna look like this. But hold on, hold on. <laughs> so, yeah. um, they're going, you know, we're gonna add the next step. Here's, you know, some pieces that I added a first layer here. But before we even do that, I'll leave these right here. Um, this is a good time to stop and think because to me, I really made a turning point in my artwork when I stopped painting so much, which is just a shocker. But I think sometimes painting can get too cerebral and you're just thinking about, oh, I want to paint a horse or a barn or, you know, go out and just paint some trees and mountains and all the neat things we have around here. And we're not really thinking about what makes a painting really good. And when I started thinking more about that, I think my art improved. And that's one of the reasons too, that I really like painting these abstract pieces. Here's one of my finished pieces again. I'll turn it around this way if you're looking in this camera. Um, for this little piece, even though it looks really like a landscape, I wasn't even thinking about a landscape when I painted it until the end of the painting. And then I thought, yeah, that could work. And so it might be fun for everybody to just start thinking about that process a little bit more. I got this is kind of icky on the back, so thanks. Yeah. Um, so I want you guys, I want everybody to think about that just a little bit, because when I started 
spending some time drawing and um, kind of thinking about the design of a good painting, that's when my art really, really improved. It wasn't that I painted, painted, painted until I got better. It was more uh, just, okay, if I look at a painting, what makes it really jump in my mind? And it came down to really good design principles. And what I mean by that is that um, design principles has to do with shape, um, spaces, lines, and they all have to blend together to make this great piece of art. And I think the real trick with good design is what I call differences in elements. So that it, if you're making a, a, a painting that has a fence line and it's all the fence posts look the same, it's not as interesting than if you make them some of them different. So when you're thinking about design, you want to think about differences. I had it explained to me one time. It was pretty interesting. This guy said, this teacher said, you know, differences is like taking a vacation and you go to Hawaii. Now that's different than what you normally do. And that's exciting. So you want to think in those terms because Good design is about differences in things. Those are the things that excite us. It's when something is different. Okay. So I'm going to go through this and then I want everybody to spend some time, maybe on your own time, looking at thinking about that because just thinking about good design changed everything for me. And so it's not like I'm trying to lecture to you. I'm trying to show you that you want to integrate these ideas when you paint, okay? And so if you go through the um, elements of design, shape would mean shape variety. Like if you have a rectangle, then make something that looks organic next to that thing. Uh, differences in space, different tonal, tonal differences. And one thing that an acrylic painter has a tough time doing is making different edges because all our edges dry really quickly and they don't, uh, there isn't any difference. But if you can work on your soft edges, that's helped me a lot, okay? Um, you don't want too much of anything. You want things to kind of work together as a group. For example, on this painting right here, since I have it handy, and I keep turning it the wrong way, sorry. Um, there's an orange in here that I put as an underpainting and it unifies the whole picture. And another thing that unifies it is this pattern link you have with these darks. So you wanna think about things that also pull it together besides the differences that you see. And that's, a good part of what makes a good painting. But the reason I add things like I did in this painting is sometimes it needs some place to stop or some element or shape that is more important than another shape. And in this case, you can see what it was, which was added after the fact. But, you know, one of the tricks I think that's really challenging or maybe fun, I think it's fun, is deciding when the painting is ready to have that center of interest added into it. And I always say, I have a group of paintings waiting to be born. For example, here's a couple of paintings besides these preliminary ones I have over here. I'll put this aside for a minute. These are some paintings that are waiting to be born. And most of these have to be four by fours. They're kind of fun. They've got something interesting going on, but they're not ready yet. They've got, or maybe, you know, uh, also there's no um, rules about orientation. You know, they can be oriented this way or this way. But I'll take a group of these and we'll do this together in, in a minute and think, 
you know, what's next? Do I like this as is? If not, what is missing? Are there not enough differences or are there not enough things that group it together? Does that make sense? And start thinking that way as you're going through this whole process. And we may take some of these paintings that are still waiting to be born and work on those tonight. We'll see where what happens. Okay, I doubt if my um, paintings that I did for you are dry, but I want to talk about one more quick thing before we start painting. And this is something that I came up with as I was preparing for the class. And you kind of have to think about, you know, how do I go about this? Because a lot of us artists tend to be somewhat instinctive. But with these paintings, like this one here, I'll put it right there. Can you guys see that all right? I'm thinking, I'm not thinking about what it is. I'm thinking about the design first in my practice. You know, I'm thinking about different shapes and different spaces between the shapes. I'm thinking about edges, soft edges and hard edges. You know, now that I look at this, maybe it's got too many hard edges. Maybe it needs a little bit more that kind of groups it together. It's a little not very organized right now. Maybe the, I like that better. I can't tell you why. I see something that could be the center of interest right there. Um, and these kind of lead to that. Like maybe an animal might be fun to paint on there or, um, you know, maybe it appeals. And this is all going to be a personal journey for you, but it's, it's a really, it's a fun one. But I think your paintings will be more exciting if you just throw out the idea of subject and think, think about edges and think about lines and think about shapes and how different they are or not. And is there a pattern that links through it? And right now for me, the jury's still out on that one. Okay. Um, what I also like you to do, and I hope you can see this from where, from the screen, but I spend a fair amount of time, and it's usually just discretionary time, thinking about what I just told you. I mean, this may be really crazy for some of you, but it, it, to me, it's more productive time than thinking about, well, I'd love to go to Teton Park today and paint. It's more about how can I make a good painting, you know? And maybe it's snowing out there, so I'm not going to Teton Park or it's already dark outside. But anyways, I do this when I get up in the morning and I often have coffee or something. And I just, I, I like to draw. I take these books right here. This has got some of my crazy stickers on it. But these are real cheap, cheapo uh, dime store sketchbooks. And I have a billion of them. And I just start drawing in them. So I wanted to show you that you could use this thinking to just play before you get your paints out. Or maybe as you get your paints out, you can remember what you did. And um, how are we doing on time? Are we doing okay? Because a little after seven. Okay. Mm -hmm. But time. what I did here is since I told you guys to get some blocks that were one, one by one ratio, which in these are four by fours, you know, or you could get six by sixes or eight by eights or five by fives. But I just made some square formats. And remember, if you're really thinking about design, the first thing you have to think about is how big is it? You know, and my beginning students often think about what they want to paint rather than how it's going to look in here. And this is huge, you guys. This is really a big deal. And I also like the two to one ratio, two to, uh, two to one. And somehow it's really appealing to the eye is these two formats. And again, this doesn't have to be three by six. It could be six by 12 
or I use 12 by 24 sometimes in the studio, big, big paintings. But anyway, um, it's, everybody has a piece of paper and a pencil and you can just start playing around with design. You don't have to be really thoughtful about it, but I am just making a shape like that. And then I'm going to make maybe another one here. And this is what I do at home sometimes over a morning coffee if I don't feel like um, drawing something. I love to draw, but this is kind of fun. So I made that. And, and I want real big, simple shapes. You know, this some of the most interesting pieces like this one is kind of coming along. There are some big old shapes there. There aren't these little dinky things, you know. They're, I've just put some big shapes there and the texture is working out pretty nice too. But anyway, I'll do some more. I'm gonna do these rather quickly so we can move along here. And, you know, I have like three or four shapes in these, you know. And one of the things too, if you're really talking good design is you wanna stay away from the center part. Squares are a little more challenging because they already have two equal sides. So you have no differences there. So um, thirds are good, you know, or at least not half. And I'm going to do a couple more. And this is what I call brain exercises, really, is what they are. Um, they kind of remind me a little bit of Matisse drawings or something that he might think about. Um, Maybe I'll do my thirds over here and go to the other third and, and uh, okay. So I've got six of those there. And then maybe I'll take uh, one and shade it in as a dominant shape. Just kind of another difference, you know, another difference, maybe those two. I'm getting a little sloppy because I'm moving along here. And I just do this for fun. And then I'll kind of go along and say, okay, I did six of those. And sometimes I do 10 or 12. Which ones really look the best? Well, I think I'll shade this one in. It's sometimes somehow the same. Yeah, shade it in. Which ones do I like? Which ones really look like they're, you know, complete as they are? And see, I'm not thinking about trees or horses or flowers or anything. I'm just thinking about how these shapes fit in this square. And so I may go, okay, usually this is how it goes for me. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. This one's kind of okay. I'm not too fond of this. So I got three here I like. And I kind of like this one the best. Just, I can't tell you how. I think it's just why. It's just variety. I kind of like the variety in that. Uh, when I make it, I want to change my edges so they're not all hard edges. Because I like that. And then you do the same thing with a two to one ratio. You know, and it's a little different because you have different format here, you know, or let's try some straight lines with some curvy lines, you know, and it's just sort of subliminal doodles. Don't start thinking about quakies or, you know, animals or, you know, this is a little tree like, that's what got me thinking. It's, it's okay. But and they can, and you can spend a long time on these. Okay, and then same thing, which ones do I like? And you can use some geometric shapes if you want and keep them separate. One thing that you might notice with mine though, I'm gonna do that just for fun. Okay, and of course that one's gonna go like that to me because there's no pattern there, too much repetition. So I am out for variety, but somehow unity and grouping. 
this kind of groups together nice. It looks like it's missing something. So I want you to take this painting with a critical eye like that. And it's not really about painting things. Okay, I'm gonna take these that I already had gessoed and we're gonna go the next step with those guys. And what I like to do next, I'll come back to my other works in progress and use these guys. And I could group them together since they're all the same height. And you don't have to use this many blocks, but I just have fun making these and so I do. But this time we'll use the black gesso and um, do the same thing. We're done with the texture for now. I like to oftentimes take the gesso and if you're doing this, you're going to want to take the gesso and I should have used a palette knife, but I don't really have to and put it on my palette because what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, add a little color in with it. And phthalo blue looks really nice. It's, it's kind of dark and, and so, so we can't see your palette. I don't know if you want people to be able to. Um, how about that? Is that better? Let me scoot it over yeah, just a little bit more. That's perfect. Yeah. And like I said, I, I apologize because I tend to spread out a bit and give myself plenty of room. So I have black on there, but the reason I put it on the palette this time is I may, I generally would not like to have color in this jar of gesso. So I often use a palette, but anyway. So we just did that drawing. Do you think I should cover it up with black gesso? I could, I did with this one right here. It's kind of cool. So if you want to do so, but when I think about the differences in design, I think about differences in light and dark. So what often I try to do with these paintings that I have done is start with real contrast, light and dark. And then I can play around with that. So that means I have to think four inch square and four by 12, this is a three to one ratio and this one, two to one ratio on that guy. But as I paint this, and you could use a diagram that you drew if you really loved it, but I'm not going to. And I'm gonna thin out the paint a little bit with water. They also have ex extensions. Now, that's pretty black. But as I have it thin, do you see how that molding paste shows up? And I like edges. Oops, I forgot to change that. I like edges that are soft, so this is a good way to make them. It's a lot of black. Maybe I'll try this one with a little bit less. Get it wet, add a little more blue. Oh yeah. And I'd also encourage you guys not to get stuck anywhere. In other words, I like the diagonal I got there. Maybe I'll do one more. I think I'll kind of try it on this. This is really going to be a little more interesting because um, of the ratio I have here. Oh, I'm going vertical again. But I work with that. I have to remind you too that you can't make a mistake. That's what's so really neat about this. I can just, you know, have some fun with this. I'm getting up. Uh, yes. That's kind of fun. I want something kind of big and blobby over here at all. This is, might be fun for kids to be involved in too. Um, and be a little careful with your spray. <laughs> you can get a little carried away, but if you really like it, you know, how about that? Another thing you can do, there's so much you can do. Isn't that phthalo blue pretty in there? 
we can do this. Pick up some of that. I kind of liked it darker though. But what I want you to think about is you're always analyzing these as you go along. And that is what is going to help you be a better painter too, because you're doing the analysis. You're not just painting to get to a certain spot. You're letting this thing sort of grow somehow on its own. I don't know how that works. But anyway, now I have a two to one. And, you know, you can also play with how your brush works. I like flats, so, you know, they work a certain way. Uh, now, diagonal look pretty good. So, and maybe I'll just kind of simplify this one a little more, have a little more white in it. Oh, what if I don't like it though? Well, then I'll go back and do something else. Okay. So that's my contrasting group right there. And so if you're working on this at home and you've gotten to this stage, you'd need to let these dry until the next layer that you put on. But what I have done, now I'll need your help, um, or if you have a tray or some something, I can set these over here as well. Um, We'll use some of these that are waiting to, to sprout or I, I'm good, thanks. And this is, these are good because they're just, you know, they're just at that stage right now. It looks like I used a little bit more blue and I would be most appreciative if I could get a little bit more water for this. Um, I tend to get kind of messy doing this kind of work. So I'd suggest that everybody has cleanup materials around. I use, I have some old rags that I bring all the time. Sometimes I set my brushes on or anything else. And then there's always paper towels, keep things clean. And um, I'm just gonna squeeze most of the dark out of that brush. Cause if I don't, it's gonna make everything darker. And we're after differences. So I'm gonna go back, thank you. I'm gonna go back to my primary colors that I introduced to you earlier. I think I can get away with using the same palette, clean this brush out a little bit. So you have to be not afraid of getting dirty in, the, in using acrylics. And um, I don't know if tube acrylics, I mean, you, do you notice how thin all this is? It's just really thin layers. So um, you, like I say, use some kind of acrylic that, um, that will, um, you know, flow real easily for you. And notice I put out a lot of white. I'm gonna try a lot of my light. My yellow, this is the quadacridone. How are you doing on time? You doing okay? Yeah. Just under 40, 40. Oh, minutes. good, okay, excellent. Okay, this is the red. And I've got some phthalo left, so I won't worry about that. And I'm gonna stick with my big brush. Looks like I brought a larger one too, but that's all right. Should have used it. Anyway, um, and like I say, just about any kind of brush will do until you get down to drawing details. So up to now, this may shock everybody, but I have not thought a single thing about what to do with these. Um, but that's the fun, you know? But I would suggest that you think about, wow, what can I do to these to create differences? Right now, for some reason, the white is bothering me. It's like, it's just too, white doesn't have a lot of depth or anything, nor this black. So I use it to prime my blocks and I use it to create contrast. But now I want to create more of a mood, I would say. And usually black and white without tones or even some color that is emotive. Uh, sometimes, well, or it'll just be kind of stark. And I guess that's not what I'm after. 
So I hope for all of you that makes some sense. But I'm going to mix up some light with acridone. Oops. And well, I think I want it kind of thin. But if you're out there working on these, I would just suggest that you get out some of your primary colors and start working on it, you know? And again, I'm just sort of building a design. I don't have any end game here. That's a little bit too different, I think, for right now, for my layers. So, um, and I don't think you need a lot. I think you can overdo it. It's kind of like somebody who's telling you a story and they tell you everything. You don't, that's a lot right there. So maybe on this guy, I'll just stick to kind of a mix of alizarin and the quidacridone gold and see where I go with this. I think I'm going to make it really thin. Wow. This, almost all of your reds are really powerful, as you can see. And what if you say, wow, that's really too much? I'm not sure it is. But look, that's kind of cool. So you can do that. It looks a little unbalanced, so it looks like something colorful has to go on over here. I'm certainly not done with this one. And I've got a lot of white on my brush too. Oh, wow, this is fun. And I try to kind of counterbalance that, or if you turn it this way or this way, maybe. It's kind of reminding me of a bunch of trees right now, but, um, you know, I'm gonna thin it. Do that. So, they're still waiting to be finished. So let's put them somewhere. <laughs> you know, didn't know we we're gonna make so many paintings today tonight, did you? Okay, and let's work with these paintings that are just in process. And we'll come back to some of the ones once we get them dry. Our um, gessoed whites are getting there. And I always say, the neat part about acrylics is they dry so fast. And the really bad part about acrylics is they dry so fast. So anyway. Do you ever use a hair dryer or anything to blow paint around? Or a um, straw? Or it's, it, it's a nice idea and I certainly, would encourage everyone to do that if you're in a hurry. But mm -hmm. I just find they dry so quickly that I don't really need to do that. Yeah. Uh, especially in the climate we live in with very little humidity, everything dries so fast. Um, in my studio, I have the option of setting it out on a porch. So if I really desperately need something to dry quickly, my brain is excited and I want to work on this thing. Um, I'll do that, but it's a good idea. I have, I have gone through a number of little hair dryers that way though. <laughs> you know, I find watercolorists use them a lot and I'm a watercolorist as well. And that's usually when you really have a good idea cooking in watercolor that, so it's a great idea if that's, you know, but that's a help. And um, it's fun to see how people perceive what I've done so far, because I'm starting to look at some of these and going, you know, simplicity is literally one of the core principles of design. And I see a few of these as being super simple. And so how much more I want to do to them is kind of like, uh. so often I'll get a group like this going on and I'll go, well, what is simple and effective and that I could do, you know, it would work pretty well and develop without lots of layering. 
And I'm looking at this one right now and maybe this one. And so right now I'm going to put these aside and we may do some detail work on these already. This is kind of um, cool as well, because even though you have to wait for these to dry, maybe it's not going to take a lot to get them dry either. And also I was going to mention this color right here is your iridescent bronze. I'll show you how it works on this one because in my brain, thinking design, this one is not done yet. It needs a little excitement going on. It's just a little bit, you know, it needs something. So I think for a moment here, I'm going to mix that up just so you can see what that looks like. I haven't used it. Maybe I haven't used this one. I had a bigger jar at home. Oh, yeah. These are really fun, but I only suggested a few because um, it depends on your budget and how much you wanna spend on some of these materials. But I find with these acrylics also, especially if you're using an extender or just water to thin them down, a little goes a long way. But I'm gonna just add a little bit of white to it. Maybe that's too much, but I'll show you what the bronze looks like. Because I just think it's it's really kind of cool. Needs a pattern. And it needs some soft edges. Hmm. That's just plain water. In the That's just water in the spray bottle. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this one's not done either. If you use an iridescent color like this, it looks great, but I think if you use too much of it, it's kind of over amps it. it you know, you want some kind of balance in, in um, what you're seeing. Um, to me, this one attracts a lot right there, even though this area contrasts more. And so all I'm saying with the iridescence is they're fun to use, but just be discreet about how much. And of course, again, you can just experiment and, and just put them all over the place. Like I'm looking over here, I showed you this one here. Remember that guy? We could put some bronze on it because it needs something happening here. It's a little dark as is though, because I've lost my contrast and white gesso would be okay too. And you might ask, well, why use white gesso when you have titanium white? Just because it covers better than titanium white. Titanium white does a pretty good job though. That's a little more exciting. This part of the painting looks like it's a little bit left out. I think I'll throw in a little more thalo. And some alizarin. And isn't that great when they kind of all blend together? And, you know, what's neat is your paintings are not going to look like my paintings. Your, your paintings are going to look like your paintings. And so um, that's another neat thing about the whole thing. So we'll see where that one goes. It's not ready yet either. It's fine right here. I didn't know I was going to take up all this space. Um, okay, I'm going to put this one aside that is drying and some of the others. We have a lot of wet paintings here. I'm gonna take this one and do something with it. And it would be great if I could hear from all of you guys and go, oh, put this there, put that there. But then again, you have your work and you get to do it, which is even better. But I just think this needs to be a lot simpler. 
See, I just blocked out a little shapes there and maybe added a little bit here. I'm going to emphasize that quadacridone yellow, gold, I should say. And, oh, I've got some black gesso. Hmm. I've got some of that guy there. Okay. And some phthalo. It just kind of punches up the color a little. And then I like the soft edges. They don't have to be all soft edges, but just a little. I'll set that over there. We'll just let that. And sometimes it'll run too. Um, one thing nice about these blocks is as long as you're on a level surface, they're nice and level and they can dry that way. But if you start, you can tip them and have some fun that way. But if you want them to dry the way you saw them, then you need to do that. Look at that. Wow, what a difference, huh? Just a few brush strokes there. I think I could develop that with some detail. So for real. And I'm keeping my palette. Probably getting a different brush. I'll just put that one there. Um, I have a couple of paintings. I'll, I'll put these aside for a minute for future consideration. Can you hand me? Uh, yeah, look, how about, yeah, that one will work. Once in a while I get to a point, here's a, what, six by six block. And I kind of like it as a landscape. And this is a really easy way to do a landscape. It's a lot like that little, do you have that little four by four? Yeah, cabin. Yeah, this, it's a little bit like this one. I call it my cabin series, but it's a really neat way to do a landscape um, without doing a lot of elaborate drawing. And that's kind of neat. So what I did here, and I'll show you the materials I use. I always bring a box of drawing materials. And this was this little sketch here was just done with some fine charcoal. I didn't have a picture or anything like that. But with this cabin series, I just sketch in some place where I think, you know, boy, a little cabin there would look really great. So I took this fine charcoal and I just sketched it in this way. And here's where I think too, spending some time outdoors, whether you paint outdoors or not is helpful because it's good to think about, well, where's this light coming from? Because in this little painting right here, although it's not done, I see kind of light coming through about in here. And this is maybe a tree-like shape and it's backlit. So that means the light's behind it. And all I've drawn is just a little, what I call a parale parallelogram for the rooftop. And I usually make them white or off-white. So I'll show you how I do that. We have about 25 minutes left. Okay, that's perfect. And usually I have some smaller brushes. These are a little bit nicer ones than I might use for covering my blocks like I was doing before. And um, I just want to get the appropriate size, but don't get too small and picky. That's one thing I want to kind of remind you of. Um, occasionally, you need a small brush for detail. Let's see what I brought to the museum today. But So I'm just going to use this one and have a paper towel or a rag handy. Um, okay, so I'm just going to take my white, my titanium, and I'm going to paint a little rooftop on here. And you don't have to really worry about the charcoal lines. This brush, I think this paint looks a little thin, but that's okay. What's your reason for choosing white? Um, this is this roof line is going to have light on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want it to look that way. And also white contrasts with what else is there. So in my cabin series, the cabin is the center of interest. So this, so that 
means that you want your eye to go to a specific thing and all the other elements help support that. And I can even go back to this paint, painting that's drying and I can see my center of interest is somewhere around here at this point, because this is contrasting to that. But there's some patterns that are leading there. And those are the kinds of thoughts that you want to go through when you're analyzing these paintings. How, how is this all working as a, as a group, as a painting? I don't have to leave it that light though. I can go from there and I might use this brush instead. I haven't really, you know, it's all. I, I just wanna encourage, especially beginners not to use terribly detailed uh, brushes because then they tend to get too picky with this. What I'm gonna try to do here is take this idea of cabin or homestead or whatever it is and work it into this idea that I have here. And so I may go back and forth with my brushes as well, because I have some other areas of the painting that I want to think about. But now I'm thinking about where the light is hitting that. And I don't always want them just white. So I, I'm just taking up too much. I'm taking a little phthalo and a little alizarin that kind of makes a gray color if I don't use too much alizarin, keep it light. And I can also just add a little, you know, um, that's not working great, but just a little bit of, I want to keep it light though. I don't know if I like that. And it depends on what kind of a building you had in mind, you know, it might have a little corner there that's kind of tweaked if it's an old barn. Or you might take, uh, brush. Um, you might take one of your lighter colors and put it in, you know, just a little lighter element in the, in the, in the area. And if the charcoal drawing is bothering you, I just wrecked my edge. But if it's bothering you, then you could cover that. Acrylic is really good at that sort of thing too. So you can make it kind of rustic looking like that. And then I'm going to take, since I have some black gesso left, that's kind of neat. Maybe I'll add a little reddish color to it. It may or may not show up. This black gesso is pretty, pretty dark. But now I have a dark side of my building there. And it kind of mimics. All of this depends on how much you are comfortable with drawing. But I think sometimes with abstract pieces, having something that is recognizable within the scene is nice for a lot of viewers to see. And, now, and, um, and I'm gonna kind of take some of this landform and integrate it just a little bit and maybe and remember, you also have the option of, of um, softening your edges, just like you had, or you can do that. You know? And I wanted to kind of integrate with that dark that's already there, which is the black gesso. It's a little bit too dark. And I like that blue, these little blue streaks. They're lighter than what I've got here, but I think I'll keep them. And although you don't want things to be the same, you also can have a certain amount of repetition to keep that pattern you've got going there. That's kind of fun, you know, but you, you can get a little carried away. So you want to kind of maintain that simplicity. And um, this is kind of an awkward shape right here. So I might, you know, I've got my, I'm going to go back to this bigger brush because it's a bigger spot. 
And it looks like it's got a little bronze in it. So let's throw some of that in there. And then take I love the combination of abstraction and realism working together. Well, they should work together in every single painting. You know, whether you're painting from life or, you know, oh, look. Now that's a little, maybe a little too distracting if I think that I didn't like it just stopping there. I wanted it to kind of go clear to the edge, but if it's, you know, and you can also kind of let it dry and see what you like. What I would think about now is darks and lights, not so much color. That kind of needs to be brought down here just a little. Yeah. Another area I think that would be fun to work on is that blue, that sky blue. And it's just a light and phthalo, but it's kind of slapped on there. So we'll see if we can organize that a little better. And um, kind of, you know, integrate it a little bit. Yeah. But don't lose that looseness about, you know, don't kind of go, oh, well, yeah, I got to make a painting. It's got to look like this, blah, blah, blah. In fact, I like that, but it's a little bit too different. A little bit of that is okay. But I am going to use that and lighten it a bit and put my other side of my barn on because we haven't done that yet. And I even often bring a cadmium red, so nice. it really looks like a red barn. Nice. So I'm almost done with this guy. What I want to look at a little bit maybe is shape and how much I like the shape. This shape is kind of bothering me a little bit here. To me, it looks like an aspen tree in the fall. Uh-huh. But the shape is a little bit wonky. So is that a, is that a, is that a real <laughs> word? Um, he looks like he got kind of a bad haircut. I don't know. Um, but we can, we can help him out here. And just don't spread him out too much. Now that's a little lighter than what I had originally. It might be nice to carry this down just a little bit too. Isn't this kind of fun? It looks like a little reflection, you know, or yeah, or or this this little guy up there like that, you know. I like this really soft back there. It just gives it some nice depth. And, you know, maybe my spray bottle is a little bit too much. I still got some hard edges on there. There are lots of other ways to do that. This is a watercolorist trick. And I had a, some dirty water, but I don't think it matters. But you can, that kind of, that probably wouldn't hurt, but just a sec. Or I can, how about this? Let's try this a little. You know, just kind of get rid of that hard edge. Ooh, that's dark. And you know, dark will cover better. Let's just try this. But I want you to not be afraid of trying things so that, um, you know, um, anything could work really well. Or, you know, you may decide that what I have here is really not what you have in mind. And so um, play with it some more. But um, it's really important to keep things simple and not get too carried away. And I think if you could think about the unity of a particular piece and simple shapes, it's a much easier to get an effective painting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oops. All right. Thank okay, so let's maybe see. Five more minutes and then okay. questions. All right. Um, yeah, I'll do one more. And um, I gotta find one that's, oh yeah, we'll use this guy. And I like to, 
often add a subject matter to my painting. So I'm going to close this lesson with something like that. And this may be something that really works for you, or maybe it doesn't. Um, but um, often I like to use animals. I kind of enjoy painting animals. And um, so I might take a painting like this and add something that is more animal-like. I keep looking at some of these and they remind me more of landscapes, but this one might work. So I'm really, this is when we worked on here and it's pretty dry. So it might be fun to put an animal in it. And if you do use animals, I have a folder right there that has, yeah, um, I keep, like most artists, I have a collection of animal uh, photos that I use. Um, often with birds, you can't really um, take good pictures unless you're a really good bird photographer. And um, so I use other people's photos or I use free photos off the internet. And all the, the, all, one thing I wanted to remind people of is if you use somebody's photo, make sure it's okay. You know, I make sure these are either free or they belong to somebody who have given me permission or I took the picture. Once in a while I get lucky and I take a good picture. But um, it's fun too to add the birds that I often do. So I go back to my charcoal and I do a little sketch and I decide where the bird belongs. And in this case, I would probably put him somewhere in here. Remember, you want to stay away from the middle, even in a two to one ratio, so that you have interest throughout. I like this pattern that's going through this. Okay. But in order to make him, I'm going to have to make him dark. So what I would do and let me know how much time I have too, because we're running low, low on time. But I would sketch, do a, a charcoal, um, this is a little wet. Do a little charcoal sketch of him here and then add the painting on. I'll just explain that and then we can you you know, have 15 minutes stop. total to the end. So to the end, to the end. Yeah, so I could talk for, you know. So I could go through this drawing, go through this painting. Yeah. All right. Um, I also have this white charcoal pencil, just in case I'm drawing on a black area. See how well that shows up? My black charcoal is not doing the job. And this is, I'm working on some wet, a little bit of damp painting, which I usually don't do. Um, but generally it's pretty easy to get rid of a drawing that you're maybe not so crazy about. One of the things I always say about even though I try to be careful about um, using, not using other people's photos, by the time I get done with them, nobody would know that I used them because I change them so much. And I draw quite a few ravens. So, you know, I would encourage you if you ever do this on your wood blocks to, um, Keep it simple. One more time. Keep it simple. And now I'm not seeing the white coming off the paper like this. So I'll use my black charcoal right here. And I want to be real careful with the proportions because that's usually what happens if you don't. And sometimes for a lot of us, it's easier to stick with something like a cabin that's a parallelogram than something like this. But I wanted to show you if we had time, how I do this. And I'm hoping I have a, a brush that works. I'll try this one. He looks kind of fun like that. And um, once again, it's okay to use the primary colors we got out. But now we might, do well to use these so that he is a little bit darker than the others. We may go back 
to the transparent colors. I often use a carbon black to start, which is just a black black because then he's gonna show up. It's just the same theory as using the gesso, the black gesso. You can kind of get a structure of the whole thing. So I'll see how I do in a demo here. Um, and so what I'm looking for in this guy is, and my brush is a little bit too wet, is his darks. I kind of like what I've got on him so far though, but he's gonna need a little dark coming out here on some of it. And again, with acrylics, you can, if you get something too dark, and black is rather harsh, so I can add a little phthalo blue or paints gray to it. I think I've got his leg like a little bit too. And I also use the white just so I get some contrast. I like how red he is though, that kind of red I've got on him. Everything's a little bit too wet tonight because we haven't taken the time to let things dry too much. He's kind of looking good, just not standing out too much either. I kind of like that. Let's put a little more white in it here and see. Okay, I'm gonna put his leg more down there than I had it. And it's good for you to see how I make corrections as well. See, I'm gonna just take that phthalo blue there and put it all gone. Well, change the painting. That's all right. Green's kind of nice too. Got a little opposite red. and lighten it a little bit. Now watch where your edges go. If you... Yeah. If you notice, I'm trying to think about the whole design, not just him. And... dark there so see you I'll try this
And this is just a little bit too wet, but I think we can work with it. Yeah. So you can add, you know, your center of interest afterwards. I'm a little reluctant to do too much more to that. Um, you know, he might do well with some highlights here in white if I can blend them in. He's still pretty wet. And I just used the black this time, but sometimes I'll show you some other paintings that I have here. Um, this guy I used, the raven, and I didn't paint him all, all the way opaque. Um, and I added mostly carbon black to him. There's a little bit of Payne's gray, which is a darker blue in the opaque group that I showed you. And um, I added a little bit of the yellow, which is the quidacridone. And it's, um, or that could have been the yellow ochre. I believe it's the quidacridone, but it's really light. You can kind of see it over there. But I tried to integrate the design a little bit more with this one, just because I felt like it worked really well. So it wasn't something that I did on purpose necessarily, but I just felt for that piece that it worked really well. We should probably switch to questions. Okay, and I'm, I'm pretty much done with my demonstration and I hope you guys enjoyed it and it made sense to you. And I'm open for questions. I'm gonna mention, Sue, you um, wanted to make sure that you brought up that anyone can do this. Um, and I, I feel like you've done a really great job of motivating us and kind of inspiring oh, us to give this a try. This has been really, really fun. I've loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. How nice. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Very Don't good. Don't be afraid to get messy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you need a little space to work and uh, an open mind. And I just love the back and forth between the abstraction and realism, figure, ground, background, foreground. I mean, it's almost like you look at it one way and you see one thing and you look at it another way and see something else. And, and the colors are beautiful. Oh, thank you. Well, I think Jane brings up an excellent point because I think one of the things we wanna do with our art is engage people in your art. And if you are participating like that, we've done what we intended to do. And I would also encourage people to look at paintings that you really admire and notice the abstract qualities and the difference between edges and the difference between lines and shapes and yet how they have grouped things in a group so that it integrates into one piece. And that is really the secret of good paintings. Jesus. I like the idea personally of having a lot of ideas right. churning and stirring that, at the that same really time. jumped out at me how you work on several pieces at once and go back and forth. Yeah. I don't think okay. you really have to have some kind of big professional portfolio. You can um, just enjoy the process. Can I add one more quick thing? If you guys don't please. mind. Yeah, please do. I brought another product I haven't shared with you yet. And this is a blast. These are those mica flakes that I have on this painting over here. Um, this one. And I'm looking at this pro or whoever he is over here that I just painted. And I'm thinking, man, he would look really neat with some mica flakes. And, um, I, but I wouldn't put them on all my paintings. 
it's just too much glitz, but it's just going to spiff him up just a little bit. Watch this. And maybe I'll use a diagonal. You know, we got a lot of verticals going in this thing. See that? Not fun. Just with a palette knife. Nice. And you could use some other. And also, don't forget that this is only one way that you could paint these. Um, I've also experimented with collage. So, and that would take more drying time as well. Like taking a, a and larger pieces, of course, are easier to add um, papers and um, other things to stencils, you know, to um, otherwise you, they're awful tiny for that. But um, mm -hmm. there's plenty of possibilities. The other thing that I brought, and I probably don't have a clean block to show you, but they're soft pastels. And I've tried those. I've even put them on my landscape paintings and they're really a lot of fun. Nice. So there's a few, and charcoal. So there's a few more um, possibilities for you. I definitely want to go home and try all of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, everybody for joining us. Uh, this was our final Make It Wild for the winter season, but stay tuned for a couple more class offerings this summer. And just so you're aware, recordings of our past classes are still available on our website. We have classes on drawing, watercolor, acrylics, pastels, block printing, and wood carving, and they're all $20 each for the recording. Um, from our website, wildlifeart.org slash learn slash adults. And thank you so much for your support. And we look forward to seeing you next time.